Okay, Dr. Brenner. Uh, my first question is, what have we learned since March about the connection between COVID-19 and patients with IBD? Yeah, so um, through the Secure IBD registry uh, that I'm a part of and different studies, we've learned a lot of important information so far. Um, overall, we found that the um, trends seen in the general population as published by the World Health Organization are similar to those that we are seeing in the inflammatory bowel disease population, um, and specifically such that older age and increased number of comorbidities are associated with worst COVID-19 outcomes. And uh, we are seeing that inflammatory bowel disease patients um, overall have fared slightly worse compared to the general population when looking at cohorts from the United States and from um, a cohort in China. Um, we're seeing that pediatric patients um, overall, if they've gotten COVID and they have inflammatory bowel disease, have um, in general had mild disease, although there are rare cases um, where there's more severe disease, pretty similar to the overall population. Um, and then in terms of medications, we're finding that corticosteroids are associated with more severe COVID-19 outcomes, whereas the TNF antagonists, which include infliximab or Remicade and adalimumab or Humira, um, those medications have not been associated with more severe outcomes um, in the IBD population. Okay. Now, is there a difference in the risk of more severe outcomes between patients with Crohn's disease or patients with ulcerative colitis? So, so far um, in the secure IBD data, we have not seen that. So um, we conducted a multivariate analysis looking at um, outcomes in patients with Crohn's disease compared to patients with ulcerative colitis. And we adjusted for factors including age and disease activity and number of comorbidities. And we did not find that the odds of having a severe outcome, meaning passing away from COVID or prior ICU stay or um, requiring a ventilator, we did not see that they were any different um, in Crohn's disease patients versus ulcerative colitis after we adjusted for all those other factors. Okay. Now, um, in the beginning of the pandemic, uh, it was thought that gastrointestinal symptoms were somewhat of a rare symptom for COVID-19 patients. But I think since then, um, the percentage of patients with gastrointestinal symptoms has uh, risen, or at least our knowledge of them have, has risen. Um, what can we actually take away from learning that there are more gastrointestinal symptoms in learning exactly how the virus attacks the body? Yeah, it's interesting. And you're right. Um, I've seen studies where um, they looked at stool samples um, from patients who contracted COVID and over half of those stool samples had RNA of the SARS-CoV-2 virus. And exactly as you're saying, many patients who develop COVID are uh, developing diarrhea or abdominal pain, vomiting. Um, and I think one of sort of the prevailing theories of how there could be a connection there is that um, the SARS-CoV-2 virus enters the body through the angiotensin converting enzyme 2 receptor or ACE2 receptor. And that receptor is found most prevalently in the terminal ileum and in the colon. Um, and it's upregulated up even further in the setting of inflammation. So that is how the virus is predominantly getting into the body. So that could explain the connection, or at least partially. But I think a lot more research is needed in this area to confirm that and to recognize what we do with that, how we could turn that into sort of a therapeutic strategy. Um, and I think there's a lot of interest in that right now. Okay. And I guess we're seeing both um, gastrointestinal symptoms as addition to the respiratory symptoms and gastrointestinal symptoms in COVID-19 patients on their own without any of the additional respiratory symptoms. Can those gastrointestinal symptoms leave permanent damage? Is there a fear of the long-term 
long-term impacts of the virus from a gastro standpoint? Yeah, I think that's a great question. And I think that's one that will require longitudinal studies in order to determine. I mean, in the inflammatory bowel disease world, I think um, there's a question of whether IBD patients who contract COVID, whether they're going to have um, long-term changes in their inflammatory bowel disease control, whether they're gonna have more GI symptoms. And I think that there are ongoing trials right now to answer that very question and to look into that, but I don't think that we have the data just yet to say 